For those of you who are just tuning in and are new to an MSC event, welcome to a Modern Sales Pros event. For those of you who are returning and watching Michelle Vanzana for another session, welcome back. Um, we love to kick things off with a fun icebreaker before we begin, so we let folks trickle in. I love to know, Michelle, are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? And also for folks who are in, please uh, drop in where you're calling in from. I see Jean from Texas. Also let us know if you're a coffee drinker or a tea drinker i'd love to know so i'm definitely a coffee drinker i like tea but i probably drink 90 percent 95 percent coffee and five percent tea so do you drink it straight black or do you have sweetener oh no no, no. it's like a milkshake i mean by the time oh, i'm done with my coffee it's like a milkshake <laughs> um a are you <laughs> are you a big Starbucks fan? I know they're not, bringing out their I'm red not, cups. No, not. Not. So it's a little strong and bitter for me. If, right, I put, right. if I put enough sugar or stevia and cream in it, then I can drink it. But it's a little, it's a little much for me. It is good. too much. I find, I find that they have this one that they just came out with. It's called sugar cookie. And at first I was like, wow, this, this sounds amazing. And I took one sip of it and I think my palate just changed because it was just way too sweet. Um, but Hey, if you, folks out there who are just tuning in, who love, you know, a lot of sugar and co and sweetener and milk in their coffee to each of their own. I, <laughs> I mean, I am drinking currently a candy cane eggnog coffee that I got from the store and I and I do enjoy it it's quite subtle um, but I also am quite a, a tea drinker recently um, I recently got really into this tea called bangle spice if though if anyone is familiar with that uh, particular tea you can get them at the store don't know what brand but it has a tiger on the box and it's delicious it has a really good like spiciness to it and i'm currently calling in from vancouver canada and it is quite foggy and cold so it's perfect for the season it's very comforting <laughs> um all right so now that you know our tea our drink of choice uh, next time you have coffee with michelle you know exactly her 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 coffee. Um, but let's begin. We're super excited to dive right into today's topic, the nature of situational sales agility. But before we begin, I like to kick things off with information about MSP. Hello, everyone. My name is Angelica. I'm one of the community event managers at MSP. And for those of you who are not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations and enablement, aka our Modern Sales Pros. I was just telling Michelle that we have about 30K members, part of the MSP community, and we're growing exponentially. And our mission is to create our environment for our members to answer questions they struggle to solve on their own and help them see around corners they may not know about. We do this through live sessions like the one you're at today. We also have an online robust form and our quarterly summits. We're also going to be back in person in events in near a city near you. So definitely stay tuned for that. And before I pass it off to Michelle, I would like to say a few words about housekeeping. First and foremost, this event is being recorded. So if you have friends or colleagues that unfortunately couldn't make it for today's live session, don't worry. The recording and key takeaways will be made available on the MSP previous event page before the end of the day. And if you have a question for our expert today, Michelle, please use the Q&A function at the top right-hand corner, or we have a chat box where you can also include your tea or coffee option preference as well as what city you live in definitely also use that for your questions for michelle we'll be sure to get them live and answer them live and today's event wouldn't be made possible without our sponsor vantage point vantage point performance empowers sales forces with research driven agility focused training tailored to fit your needs they train salespeople to be more fluent and comfortable across different situations needing different sales approaches they train sales managers to be better coaches and team leaders with more focus and less stress i'm going to drop their link in the chat so definitely check them out they're doing amazing stuff now i'm going to pass it off to michelle Michelle, if you want to say a few words about yourself, and then I'll come back for wrap up. Sure. Um, so Michelle, take it away. Thank you. So uh, yes, I'm so uh, happy to be with you today. Um, I am one of the co-founders and chief strategy officer of Vantage Point. Um, I have the, um, the privilege of setting our strategy 
doing the, uh, the most of our research and writing and publications. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, and today I'm going to be talking with you about situational sales agility. And I'd love to share my screen if I could, Angelica. It's showing that I can't share it right now. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Uh, nope. Let's see. All right, I'm going to share my window. PowerPoint. Okay, let me get back to the beginning here. Put this in presentation mode. Are you, is everybody seeing my screen? Angelica, are you seeing it? Okay, so welcome. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of context really before we dive too much into the content. Uh, and the context is this idea that we're going to talk about what it means to be agile, what it means to be adaptable, um, and what it means to be able to adapt to different situations. And so I've given you here sort of a general overview or definition of agility. And the reason I'm giving you this general overview of agility is because when we did our research, <clears throat> what we found is that <clears throat> this idea of flexing the sales approach to the buying situation was not something that any of the sales training companies were doing at that time. It was a really new idea. So as researchers, we really had to look outside of the sales arena and look at other domains like the military, professional sports teams, first responders, and, and determine what do they do to train agility into the role. Because if you're a fighter pilot, you have to be agile, right? You can't follow a sort of one size fits all and do the same thing all the time or you don't live very long. The same with athletes. Um, you know, you have to be able to change the play based on what you're facing. And first responders have to be agile because so many of the experiences and situations they face are very different. And so they have to be able to recognize what's going on. So when we when these when the researchers actually looked into these different domains, what they found is there's actually some pillars of agility that are true in any domain, including sales. So there's the three primary pillars that any person needs if they want to be agile in their job. And the first pillar is really called situational intelligence. And it's the ability to assess and make sense of the situation that you're facing. Uh, the second pillar is situational readiness. And that's all about determining and choosing the best path of action for the situation that you're in. Then we have situational fluency, the final pillar, which is about executing the actions that you've chosen. And in every domain where agility is necessary, you have to monitor the impact and monitor changes in the situation. So when we think of these three pillars, these three pillars are really the same um, for any domain. So if we take a look at first responders, for instance, from a situational intelligence perspective, they have to be able to assess the patient's symptoms. What's going on with that patient? Uh, and they have some ways that they go about triage that they learn, you know, when they're preparing for that position. Then they actually have to administer and choose a treatment option amongst many treatment options. Which one is most ideal for the patient's symptoms that they're encountering? They have to execute and actually administer the medical treatment. And then, of course, they have to monitor the impact um, and see about patient progress. So... This is true for first responders. It's true for fighter pilots. It's true for, you know, football quarterbacks. Uh, it's true for salespeople. But when we think about sales agility, it gets a little bit more specific. So sales agility is the ability to adapt sales behavior based on changes in the buying situation an individual is facing. So when you think about sales agility, it's really the ability to assess and make sense of the buying situation, select the optimal path forward, which sales approach will work best, um, execute that path, and then continually monitor the impact to the buyer and the buying situation. So if you've seen me talk about sales agility before, you know that we've done robust studies um, into the area of agility across the entire organization. I'm not gonna review that research in this particular webinar, but I'm going to give you um, a place where you can request a white paper 
I've written recently that the details that agility journey um, and can give you the insight between behind how these insights came about um, and what they mean for sales agility. So a culmination of that research in order to help you make sense of sales agility, because there's a lot of differing perspectives out there. When we did this research, we identified that number one, there's patterns of agility across the sales force. And we found that there's really three levels of sales agility necessary and important for the sales force. There's organizational agility, which is primarily an internal thing where organizational leaders and sales managers ensure that field execution is directly aligned to organizational goals and marketplace realities. And when either of those change, adjustments have to be made in what people are executing and how managers are coaching. Then there's situational agility, which is really about understanding that different buying teams represent different buying situations and the best top performing salespeople execute different strat sales strategies depending upon the situation they're facing. And further research identified this foundational level of agility where the most agile sellers have to understand not only the buying journey, but the psychology behind the journey and how emotions impact that buying journey. So today, we're really going to hone in on situational sales agility. Um, we'll discuss the other two in other webinars that we do with a modern sales pros. So what were the findings of these research studies on situational sales agility? What did we learn about how high performers behave and how that's different than everybody else? Well, what we learned was that in each sales force, sellers face between four and six unique buying situations. Uh, that are meaningfully different from one another. We also learned that salespeople display four patterns of selling behavior, not one. And high performers actually choose different strategies based on the situation they face, whereas average and low performers use the same strategy regardless of how different the situation is that they face. So pretty important findings, very different than conventional wisdom around selling, where you know, everyone tried to incorporate and train that one methodology that was gonna work the best and then standardize around that one methodology. And this research said, that's really not the way to go. And that's, not, that's certainly not the way high performers behave. Uh, and Forrester research identified that your high performers are the least likely to adopt and use your one size fits all sales methodology. So really the theme here is high performers are agile. And the next question is, well, if high performers are agile, then how do you enable sellers to actually be able to execute with agility? Because again, it's not, it's not about standardization. It's about understanding buyers, flexing accordingly to drive the best outcomes, and quite frankly, the best buying experience. So agility really is composed of or comprised of two important things. There's a mindset and there's a skill set. And we're going to start by talking about the mindset. We're going to give you an opportunity for a little bit of reflection. So I'm going to put these four statements on this slide. I want you to read through each of these four just quickly. And then I want you to pick one that you believe best describes you and your mindset. So take just a couple seconds and choose which one resonates with you most fully. So you might have identified more than one. Um, and here's how those mindsets line up. Um, there is a, uh, a professor who wrote a book called Mindset. Her name is Carol Dweck. And she identified something called a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And for agility, you really need a growth mindset. And a growth mindset has the perspective that, you know, you are actually changeable. You can adjust and adapt your behavior. You can change things about who you are. People with a fixed mindset believe, well, I am the way I am, and there's not really much to be done about that. And maybe I can do things differently, but the important parts of who I am are really fixed. And as you can imagine, the growth mindset uh, is the one most closely aligned to what's needed for true situational sales agility because people with a growth mindset are much more likely to want to learn new things and take on new challenges. People with a fixed mindset are more likely to avoid risks 
and they're very concerned with proving how smart they are. They want to be right, right? They want to be right. They want to be an expert uh, and they don't want to have to change the way they do things. So the nature of agility really requires a growth mindset so that you can always be reflecting and, and questioning your approach to see, are there ways that I can adjust, amend uh, my approach in order to be even more effective at selling and create better and better buying experiences? So if we take this idea of a growth mindset, we also have skill sets. So the skill set that's required for sales agility is being able to assess the buying situation that you're facing, choose the best sales approach amongst many, execute the appropriate tactics within that sales approach, and then monitor buyer reactions and get feedback. And, and around and around it goes. So this is the core skill set that we're going to be talking about today as we're talking about situational sales agility. So one of the first questions is, how do top performing sellers assess the buying situation? There are so many things to know. I've just got a smattering of potential buying factors up here on this slide. And when we did the research, we started with over 25 buying factors. And those were the buying factors that were relevant to the buying situations that we were studying. And we thought, wow, that's really not a good message. Telling people, well, in order to be agile, all you have to do is learn these 25 things. It was really not a, an executable or operationalized approach. And when we looked at these buying factors a little more closely, we spotted patterns in the buying factors. And what we recognized was that these buying factors actually fit into five separate categories, problem awareness, competitive landscape, customer dynamics, buying stage and solution definition. And this is a much easier thing for sellers to get their head wrapped around. Oh, I need to understand these five categories. And once I gather uh, enough information about these five categories, I can use that information um, to make sense of this buying situation. So we've got these buying factors and the most effective sellers assess these buying factors and then make sense of that buying situation. How do they do that? Well, in order to assess the buying situation, right, you're, you have to seek information to draw as complete of a picture as possible. And then you have to orient that information into a picture that makes sense to you. So it's not just gathering information, it's evaluating that information critically to make sense of what this means from a buying situation perspective. And there are some pretty common sources of input that sellers utilize in order to gather this information. Some of it is in conversation with the buyer, some of it is just observation, some of it's through feedback, um, and they do research, right? There's lots of great places to do research on buyers today. But as we went through um, this research and then developing frameworks to be able to execute against this research, we identified some common buying situations that we see across industries. And they're here on this slide. And the names don't matter. <laughs> we gave them these names just for convenience. But we found that across all the buying situations we studied, we, we'd studied over 4,000 deals. And when we studied over 4,000 deals, we found there are actually four very common patterns of buying situations across industries. And we call these situation archetypes. So there's the confused customer. And this is where the customer may have a blind spot that they're not aware of, and you have to change the way they think. Um, the bottom line buyer, they trust your company as a partner. They know what they want. You don't have to help them figure that out, but they want to maximize their budget and get the best ROI. Then we have the savvy shopper. And this is a customer who knows what they want. They've got a formalized buying process and they're, you're on a short list and it's a highly competitive situation. And finally, we have the proactive partner. Um, they have a pain, but they're not certain exactly what it is or the root cause. They're open to ideas and they appreciate collaboration. They see you as a collaborator. So these four very common buying situations give sellers that we train something to use as a filter or an aid to be able to make sense of the factors they've uncovered and what that means from a buying situation perspective. So once a seller has assessed and made sense of that buying situation, the next step from a skill perspective is to choose the best sales approach. And we said they're gonna choose the best sales approach amongst multiple possible approaches. 
And we found in the research that there's really four patterns of selling behavior that occur, not one. There's a consultative strategy, which is a highly collaborative strategy that most of us have been trained on. Um, there's a financial strategy that really drives building a business case and driving ROI. There, there's a disruptive strategy that challenges the way the customer's thinking, creates awareness and helps shape their thinking in a way that's gonna be more helpful for them. And there's a competitive strategy that helps you differentiate and shine against your competitors. And the question is, you know, which strategy best matches my customer's buying situation? And that's how we choose the match between strategy and buying situation. If we go back to those buying situation archetypes, we can then link those to one of these four selling approaches. So if you have a confused customer, you should strongly consider using a disruptive approach. And we say strongly consider versus absolutely because buying situation are fluid, they're dynamic, and they change. So you may actually start with a disruptive approach and then change to a competitive approach or a financial approach later in that buying journey. Um, if you have a bottom line buyer um, who wants you know, to really drive ROI, you may strongly consider a financial approach. And if you have a savvy shopper who kind of knows what they want um, and you're on a short list, you may consider competitive. And finally, if you have a proactive partner who's open to high collaboration, you might want to use a consultative approach. So this just gives you some sense for what are the typical types of buying situations that we see, and then which types of strategies are most effective for those buying situations. So when we take it to the next step and we think about the skills that are needed to be situationally agile, once you've chosen your primary strategy, you then have to execute the appropriate sales tactics within that strategy. And we also know from the research that each of these strategies have three core tactics within them. And the question is, which tactic or tactics best advance the strategy given the next interaction that I have in a given buying situation? Now, what's interesting is that you can think about the strategy really at the opportunity level. It's likely that a salesperson is going to choose a dominant strategy, but it's not exclusive because as that buying situation changes, the primary strategy may have to adjust as well. You may start with consultative and then shift to competitive. You may start with disruptive and then shift to financial. So they're not fixed, but at any one point in time, the buying situation as presented will lean toward the selection of a certain strategy. And as that buying situation changes, that strategy may have to adjust. So that's sort of at the opportunity level. When you think about the sales call level, you're gonna be selecting one or two primary tactics that you wanna execute in that next sales conversation. And the tactics are very flexible within and between strategies. So if I have a primarily consultative strategy, I may choose a disruptive tactic for a particular call. Or if I'm using a financial strategy, I may choose a consultative tactic for a particular sales call. So these are not fixed. It's not a one and done. Once I choose my strategy, there are tactics aligned to that strategy, but I can either switch the strategy and or pull in tactics from other strategies as needed in order to execute the next conversation uh, most effectively. So a lot of dynamics at play here when it comes to situational sales agility. Um, I'd like to now um, just kind of summarize, right? We talked about strategies, we talked about tactics. Um, and what I'd like to share is that when it comes to executing these different strategies, all four of these strategies have a combination of seeking and giving. From a seeking perspective, everybody that's tuned into this webinar has probably had some sort of sales training and you've likely had some sort of consultative sales training. So you've learned some kind of questioning model, um, some kind of, you know, you might have taken spin selling, you might have taken a variety of different types of selling, right? Consultative selling approaches. Um, and what we find, especially as it relates to sales agility and this whole idea of buying situations and the buying journey, many sellers um, that aren't necessarily high performers they learn questioning approaches, but they don't, they don't lean enough into the emotional aspects of some of those questions. They don't necessarily really dig into the pain enough 
or really explore the customer's viewpoint of what they want, why they want it and how it's going to change. But this balance of seeking and giving is critical in any one of these four strategies. So when it comes to giving, you can see, you know, some of these tactics that become orange. There's lots of, of evidence of giving information in these different tactics. And when sellers are giving information, you often think of features, advantages, benefits, you know, competitive differentiators. But what we found is that the most effective way to give information, well, to seek and give information, right, has emotional content. And it ties to the emotions that a buyer is likely experiencing. And the most effective way to give information as a salesperson is to give it in the form of a story. And the most effective stories allow the buyer to be able to relate to what's happening in the story and then reflect on whether or not that's true for their particular buying situation. So seeking information, critical, giving information, critical, the most effective sellers, the most agile sellers seek information, not just about the facts about the situation, but the emotional content of the situation. And they give information in ways that really include storytelling and really driving the emotional content of that story to relate to that buyer. So when you put all of this together, you see there's this approach or framework for situational sales agility of assessing the buying situation and understanding the buying factors, choosing which sales approach works best amongst multiple sales approaches, executing the tactics within that strategy or other strategies as well, and then monitoring buyer reactions and constantly gaining feedback. Now, what may look a little bit different in this approach to situational sales agility versus what you've been trained on is that most sales training focuses on sales execution. They give a very specific approach and then teach salespeople how to execute that approach. When we studied high-performing salespeople and found out that they were situationally agile, what we found is that the most successful and agile salespeople, they spend more time assessing the buying situation and choosing which approach works best before they execute. And so it's a decision-making framework. This idea of assess and choose and execute results in better decisions that high performers make about the situation they face and how to best navigate that. And again, it's not a one and done. These high performing sellers are constantly assessing and reassessing the buying situation, making and adjusting their choices and executing what's most relevant to the buying situation and changes in that buying situation. So the best sellers and the best managers are the best decision makers. And the decisions they make have to do with the situation they're facing, how I approach that situation most effectively, and then how to execute the choice that I have made. So I'm gonna pivot for just a moment here. And I'm gonna pivot and I'm gonna share with you some another um, perspective in the marketplace that's becoming more common. There's even a couple of books written about this. And I've looked into this pretty deeply in the past few months. And that perspective is that sales agility is similar to and benefits from principles of agile software development, particularly agile sprints and scrum. So I don't know how familiar the audience is with agile software development. Um, the scrum approach is the most popular methodology for agile software development. You can also think of other um, things like Six Sigma and Lean. Those are all approaches to developing products and or improving manufacturing. They really have nothing to do with psychology, human behavior, uh, and influencing buyers. So when you think about Scrum, the way that agile software developers develop software is you have a whole bunch of developers who are doing these things called sprints. They're developing small pieces of code separately from one another on different topics. Um, now that's completely different than the way a sales team approaches a big opportunity, right? If I have a sales team, say I'm an account manager, a global account manager, and I've got multiple people on my account team, we're not doing things independently. We're working as a team, we're strategizing and executing together to make a more powerful approach. So when you think about agile sprints, very appropriate for software or even product development, not really appropriate for selling. Uh, in fact, an agile software development environment is very internal to the developer. It's a high control environment. 
agile selling is external to the seller's environment because buyers are very changeable, malleable, adaptable, and oftentimes unpredictable. Um, I was interviewing a senior leader with IBM last week who is responsible for agility within the sales force, and he's certified in agile, and he's, he's an expert, to say the least. And I said, what do you think about this perspective that agile software development and scrum and agile sprints are actually synonymous with agile selling? And he said, I don't see the similarity at all. He said, it actually sounds to me like a bit of a hack. So I only tell you this because you're going to hear a lot in the coming years about sales agility, and you're going to hear a lot of different perspectives on sales agility. And I would urge you, if you are looking to bring sales agility into your own set of behaviors or your organization, look under the hood and make sure you understand the genesis of whatever approach uh, is being recommended to you. So in summary, we talked today about situational sales agility, um, which is really this core of agility customer facing, which ensures that the most agile sellers understand that different buying teams have different buying situations. They need to assess the buying situation, choose a sales approach amongst multiple sales approaches, execute the right tactics and continually monitor and assess that buying situation. What happens when sellers behave this way? We've gotten a few different metrics from our customers over the last several years. More revenue per seller, dramatic increases in win rates, and tremendous increases in overall sales. One of our customers over the past 24 months more than doubled their sales. So significant impacts when sellers not only learn but practice um, situational sales agility. So what are the takeaways from here? Well, one of them is that you can get our white paper. We've recently written this white paper and that white paper includes all the details of the significant research studies that went into our approach to agility beyond just situational. All of this is also informing our new book that's being published by McGraw-Hill um, called The Sales Agility Code, Deploy Situational Fluency to Win More Sales. Um, this will be available for, for pre-order in the January, February timeframe and hitting the bookshelves and Amazon and all the other suppliers um, in the April timeframe. Um, as far as our content today, Sales agility is the ability to adapt the sales approach based on the buying situation a seller faces. Agile salespeople assess and make sense of the buying situation using these five categories of buying factors. Sales tactics are fluid and interchangeable based on changes in the buying situation. It's like a toolbox, a tool belt with different tactics in that tool belt. You pull out the one you need based on the situation you're facing. And finally, agile software development is really brilliant, but it doesn't equal sales agility. So actions you can take, you can request our white paper. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. We'd love to send it to you. Um, you can watch a video about sales agility by um, entering this um, into your browser. Uh, and finally, if you want to, you can contact me if you want to have a conversation about sales agility. So Angelica, back to you. Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's event. If there's any questions for Michelle, we have time for questions. So be sure to ask your questions in the Q&A panel or in the chat. We'll leave a couple minutes if anyone has any questions. So Angela, I can bring one up um, while sure. you're waiting. So one of the most common questions that we get, especially from you know sales leaders and sales enablement leaders, they say, you know, I have a hard time getting my people to do one sales approach. And now you're telling me that there's really four. And, and they've seen challenges in driving adoption. Let's say they trained on a consultative selling methodology and they're, they're not getting their people to adopt it. Well, what we found when we looked into individual sales methodologies is that they tend to be highly complex with many, many steps and many, many tools. And when we developed this framework for sales agility based on what high performers actually do, each of these sales approaches, these four, is far less complex than any methodology that's out there on the market. So what we've been able to do is really bring sales agility down to its essence, down to its core, and eliminate a lot of the noise. So we've actually had sellers that have been in sales for over 25 years that went through our program and said, oh my God, this is the most realistic and useful sales training program I've ever been through because it really reflects what I do in the field. I just couldn't really put words to it. 
And the feedback that we get is it's relevant, it's simple, and it's executable. It's not more complex because you're really pulling out the essence of what the most successful salespeople do, not adding all of the extraneous things to make it fit any circumstance. Absolutely. Yeah, that's pretty much the most important one. Um, we have a question from Keith. Out of the four methods, is there an approach that is used to close deals versus run a sales process? Oh, Keith, good question. Um, all four of those actually drive closing of deals. But the question you asked is very interesting because we did some additional research very recently on these four sales strategies. Um, and we wanted to see, we wanted to answer two questions, Keith. One of them was, is consultative just one of the four or are there more correlations within these strategies than, than meets the eye? And what we found is that consultative tactics are used highly regardless of the primary tactic or strategy selected. So if I'm using a, a disruptive or challenging strategy, I'm still using a fair amount of consultative tactics, regardless of whether disruptive or financial or competitive is the primary strategy. But then Keith, we looked a little more closely. Since consultative tactics are utilized highly, we looked at the three primary tactics to determine which of those tactics is most highly correlated to wins in over 4,000 deals that we studied. And we thought it was going to be uncovering needs, but it wasn't. It was obtaining incremental commitments along the buying journey. So I guess my answer to you, Keith, is you're going to be pulling in tactics to gain incremental commitment in each conversation, regardless of the primary strategy that you're using. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Keith, for answering that. And I dropped the links that Michelle put on her presentation in the chat for easy access. Just a reminder for everyone, the recording and key takeaways along with Michelle's presentation and all the links shown will be made available on the MSP website. We'll also send it to you via email uh, just so you can get a heads up that we it's up and live. But just want to say thank you so much again, Michelle, for your insights and expertise. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session. We'll see you at the Thanks. next event. Great. Thanks, Angelica. Thanks, everyone.